I went to Bit Summit this year, a large event dedicated to indie game developers, especially those from Japan, to get in touch with fellow creators and get some tips from them. The event takes place in Kyoto, once Japan's capital, now a large city rooted in the country's history. Early in the morning, it's all the neighborhoods are peaceful, but don't let the pretty pictures fool you. Most shops open around 10am, after which it quickly gets crowded, especially on a sunny day. As it's dedicated to players, the Bit Summit wasn't the best place to talk at length with developers, but I did meet with and interview Papadar, who taught himself programming after working as a game artist for years, and I met with the CrossCode team. You may have seen their impressive action RPG on the channel and in the good course already. These guys were kind enough to share their insights on game creation with us. So without further ado, let's turn the floor to Papadar and his surprising sandbox platformer, Eatvolt. I'm a game developer based in Melbourne, Australia. I have a history as a 3D artist and more recently I've started to learn programming and I'm showing my first game here at Bit Summit. The idea is originally from Global Game Jam where the theme was the Ouroboros. I came up with this idea at that event but we didn't proceed with the design at that point. Years later when I thought I should start learning programming, this seemed like a simple enough idea that I could create it. And since then, it's grown a lot beyond that original idea. Let's make a short break here. In Evolve, you eat other species to evolve. The game followed the theme of Ouroboros in that it's an endless cycle where you eat other species to gain new powers and be able to explore new places. You're meant to experiment and have fun with all the powers you can gain, but also the different shapes your character can take. Oh, and if you get eaten, you start back at the beginning. It's a mixture of manual work and procedural. The body parts are all painted by hand, whereas the wings and shell, they are a separate sprite, so I, I share them between all body types. I have a few hundred sprites for the player. Yeah, hopefully getting close to the complete set. I wanted to ask Papadar how he came to teach himself programming. Especially as an artist, it's often a little hard to get into code as it feels opposite to art. It was challenging just to get started. I tried learning programming previously with some online tools that became frustrated and given up. But with Game Maker, I was able to get over the first hurdle. And when I first had a very basic playable thing that I had made, it was really exciting and easy to see where I could improve the game. I think that was important, having something that I was working on rather than an abstract programming lesson. So that's an important takeaway. It's useful to use a project to keep you going and stay motivated the entire time. Now, you do need some foundations when you learn programming, and that's what I try to explain in a recent guide to help you get started with game programming. Without formal training, I've spent sometimes a long time trying to solve a problem to discover later on that there's a command. For instance, Lerp. Yeah, I had seen the easing motion of a camera in other games and I wanted to recreate that, so I maybe spent a few days developing this motion only to find out months later I could call the Lerp command and <laughs> that would do the same job. So yeah, this happens often when you learn and practice on your own. You tend to find complicated solutions to problems that have been solved by others before you. Since I started looking at good programming books, lessons, participating in open source projects especially, and looking at the work of very experienced developers asking for reviews sometimes, my understanding of code, code structure, and why developers sometimes make complicated scripts or patterns to break down files, etc. My understanding of programming has evolved a lot. So as you are creating your games, I really recommend that you look out to communities where there are people who are more experienced than you, where you can learn from them and pick up new skills. Thanks, Papadar. It was a pleasure meeting you. And now on to the next interview where we're going to talk about slightly different questions. Felix, who happened to be the author of an ambitious RPG maker game named Versar Ball, managed to build a team and keep development going for seven years on CrossCode. It's a large action RPG with dozens of hours of content, something that's both hard and risky for indie developers to make. The team found a good business model focused on slow but highly polished updates. Thanks to this, they managed to get the overwhelmingly positive rating on Steam, which allowed them, in turn, to sell well in early access. 
The game is ambitious with its 3D gameplay in 2D. The team's custom engine does work with three axes. Our exchange focused on two aspects of game creation we rarely have the opportunity to approach, working with a custom engine on the one hand and keeping a remote team going for years. I'm Felix, also known as Laxen, co-founder of Radical Fish Games. I'm working on CrossCode, which will hopefully be released this year after about seven years of development. You chose to work with JavaScript and web-based technologies. Why did you make that choice? What were the advantages? That was mostly because I've been working with web technologies for several years before the whole project started at university. I did an internship where we worked on an HTML5 game. That's when I discovered that it's actually possible to work with the technology to create games with it. I just was very comfortable with it. I liked working with the language. I had experience with C++, with Java and other languages. And I just had most fun working on HTML5 projects. And that's why I just decided, hey, let's try to create an HTML5 game. Then seven years later, we have CrossCode makes it easy to create your own tools because you have full control over it. Would you recommend other game developers to make their own tools? It really depends on what kind of game you create. We are working on an action RPG which is content heavy, so we have to create a lot of large worlds with a lot of cutscenes. The more content you create, the more likely I would recommend to create tools. To be honest, in the beginning, even I was skeptical and I thought it's probably okay to just modify JSON assets and stuff like this. But over time, I always changed my mind and created an editor, sometimes way too late. This just accelerates the whole development process a lot. No no matter what engine you use, if you create a content-heavy game, it's always important to consider tools, I think. Does the final game match your initial plan and intended scope? Actually, yes. Even though people often expect like uh, when a game grows on like this, it usually is because you just keep extending the scope. But that actually didn't really happen all that much. We really had a, a story in mind by the time we did the crowdfunding, which to be fair was after three years of development. We knew the amount of areas, then it just took us that long to create the content we initially planned. It's just that we really underestimated the amount of work. We may have overscaled certain things so like the dungeons turned up to be way too long. It just happened, like I, I worked on the dungeon, the first major dungeon. I didn't really calculate the number of rooms, which may have been a mistake. I probably should have checked other games, like how many rooms do dun dungeons have. So I just went ahead, made the first dungeon and it ended up being two hours long. Then this was the default size for a dungeon crosscode. And that's also part of the reason why the game became so huge. Every dungeon is really, really long. It's sometimes a good idea to look at other games when you plan content like this. So that, that's kind of the mistake we made. To some extent, some people don't like the long dungeons. Some other players actually like them. So it's not necessarily just a downside, but it's just a risky thing to do that as an indie developer. How often do you end up taking scripts that exist or bits of code, refactoring them, like improving the structure, moving them around? Is it a big part of your job as a developer? It happens fairly often, not that often recently. I think in the beginning it happened more often, but from time to time we did have to go over certain code fragments and restructure them. For instance, at one point I restructured the way the rendering is structured because of some optimization problem. The game became really slow even on Chrome browsers. Same for the physics or the interface rendering. There was always like a step where I actually had to go over things and optimize the structure because we discovered the bottlenecks and discovered some problems in particular with JavaScript, you have to be careful how you structure your code or your data. The thing that always surprised me is it's actually not as much work as you think it is to restructure things. It's actually a good thing. I think it's impossible to make everything right from the very beginning. You should not be too afraid from the prospect of having to refactor stuff. Something that really helped us is the fact that all the assets that we have in CrossCode, they're all JSON-based. That's why it's very easy to search them with regular expressions and replace certain arguments. If we have to restructure things in a way that we have to change our assets, I very often just use regular expressions to change all the assets connected to the change. That really helped a lot, so it's something I can recommend. Using text-based assets simplifies the development process in that regard at least. It's also very nice if you use version control systems like Git, because every change is just a line of code. It works well with Git as well.
We're going to talk a bit about project management. How do you work on CrossCode? Is it a full-time job for you, for your teammates? Do you work remotely or in an office? We all work remotely. We are in the same time zone because most of us are based in Germany. One in Austria, somebody moved to Finland, which is still fairly close. We all communicate over the internet and using a Discord server. We started with Skype, which also worked but was nearly as good. So having like a good software to communicate really helps. Discord is nice because you have voice chat integrated. I think Slack would also work well. Our team is about, I often say like 12 people. Never entirely sure because we have a lot of people in the team that help part-time and sometimes just if something comes up. Like on the one hand, we have our team member from Vienna who has a full-time job, but sometimes he wants to help us with pixel art and then I sometimes give him a job and like a few times per month he creates some nice graphics for us. For me, it is a full-time job. Some people are working full-time. A lot of other people are working part-time and uh, helping out. So that is kind of the structure. It's it's also kind of flexible. Some people will help out a bit more or a bit less, depending on how the needs are. Overall, it works out pretty well for us. Well, we have the same team members for a long time already, like four or five years. It may not be the most productive approach. I'm sure that if you actually meet up in an office space and work together physically, it might improve productivity a lot. It's maybe a less stressful, a less risky way to develop an indie game because the cost is also not quite as high as if you would make the effort to get everyone in the same town and work together in an office space. In the end, this just kind of happened because of how things started. We knew each other from the internet and we just kept working over the internet. How did you meet with and found the persons to work with on this project? And how did you manage to keep everyone going for so many years? We met each other over the internet. There was this kind of uh, RPG maker community, you know, this, this old engine to make RPGs. Back when there was still RPG Maker 2000, there wasn't even an official release in Germany, so there was a, some unofficial way to get the software translated. Most of us started with RPG Maker. We got to know each other through some online communities. We met each other over time, and I started working on the prototype for CrossCode, and people joined to work on the project. In terms of motivation, there are certain things we do to stay connected. We do voice chat sessions where everybody meets up and we talk about what we are working on the game. We are planning some content. We have this kind of development process where it's not just one person that decides everything. It's very often based on initiative. Somebody does something, things are then discussed in the team and people give feedback and that's how we collect ideas and uh, come up with the end result very often. And a lot of great ideas is from random brainstorm sessions where we just threw around some puns and then suddenly we had a great idea. <laughs> yeah, and then of course two times per year we meet up in Germany. We rent a flat and work together on the game for a week, cross week. We not only work but also do some other stuff like watching videos, playing games, and things like this. So these are more or less social events. I mean, they also have productivity of course because when you're together it helps a lot to communicate more effectively. We also go to events like what we're doing right now. We are now in Japan to promote the game. It's also kind of a team event. We get together and we travel somewhere and that helps to connect to some degree. I think that's at least part of the reason why everyone is still part of the team. Thank you very much. Any last words? I just hope that we finally will be able to finish CrossFit this year and I'm really thankful that so many people in our community have been so patient to wait for this long time for us to finish this game because seven years really is a long time. I'm really surprised that we have so many people that actually are patient enough to just wait that long and are not pestering us about releasing the game early. I'm really thankful for that and let's just hope that it will actually come out then.